Okay, so good evening, everyone. And thank you very much to all of you for your presence tonight. We are celebrating together the seventh night of ideas as organized by Alliance Française de Candy, en ligne, which has been the case over the past two years. Um, this event is recorded and we will be um, posting the recording on our YouTube page. Um, please, as much as possible, as I just um, asked you, if you can turn your camera on to keep the, the, the recording as lively as possible, this will be very much appreciated. So the Night of Ideas uh, was initiated in, in 2016 um, during a very big Paris night that brought together um, French and international thinkers who were invited to discuss the major issues of the time. And it was a huge success and, and, and it quickly became a defining feature of the French agenda around the world. So every year on the last Thursday of uh, January, the French Institute invites all cultural and in educational institutions from the French network to celebrate the free flow of ideas and knowledge. On that very night, um, conferences, meetings, forums, roundtables, screenings, artistic performances, workshops take place, um, focusing on a specific theme, which is chosen every year and is meant to be locally revisited and appropriated by each and every participant. So for the seventh night of idea, as you know, the, the chosen common theme is rebuilding together. So it is meant as an invitation to explore um, the resilience and reconstruction of societies faced with singular challenges, possible solidarities and cooperation between individuals, groups, communities, states, the mobilization of civil societies and the challenges that have been triggered by um, the, the pandemic basically, and how, how can we address those changes and the need to rebuild. Um, even the choice of this very theme and its interpretation can be debated tonight. Um, what we aim to celebrate in the spirit of the Lumière and of what the president of Alliance Française de Candy and our moderator for the night, Mrs. Shyamali Ranaraja calls a distinctly French event is uh, freedom of thought. So Mrs. Uh, Shyamali Ranaraja, attorney at law, uh, will tell you why this year in Sri Lanka we have decided to take part in this event. Let us wait no longer and I would like to briefly, briefly introduce our four panelists uh, before handing over the floor to Mrs. Shyamali. Our greatest thanks for accepting our invitation. Um, our greatest thanks go to Professor D.B. Nugegoda, former professor of community medicine at the University of Peradenia. Professor uh, Veranja Karunaratne, fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, Chevalier de l'Ordre des Palmes Académiques, senior professor uh, at the Department of Chemistry of the University of Peradenia and vice president of Slintech Academy, which is specialized in uh, nano and advanced technology. Dr. Kalana Senaratne, senior lecturer um, at the Department of Law of uh, Faculty of Arts, University of Peradenia. And Dr. Kadira uh, Pitiagoda, foreign policy expert, former Brookings Fellow, diplomat, PhD from the University of Melbourne, ministerial advisor and author of numerous articles. Apologies for the French pronunciation of your names. Um, this is uh, maybe a first. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again for your presence and I'm, we are all very much looking forward to this event. Thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, doing the honors and introducing the uh, purpose of the evening, as well as uh, introducing our very distinguished panel uh, of speakers tonight. Uh, it is a great honor and a pleasure to have you with us today and our distinguished uh, audience as well. I hope uh, more of uh, you will be joining us uh, as we go along. 
Um, and I, to add to uh, the introduction that Sara made, uh, it is worth noting that Professor Veranja has been a past president of the Alliance Frontier, as well as uh, being a, long, a life member and a long standing benefactor of the Alliance Frontier. So we welcome you all very warmly, and we are indeed honored to be here uh, that, uh, with us today. Uh, I, as Sara mentioned, uh, it's in sync that the uh, French Institute. Uh, night of Ideas is in sync with what we are going through in Sri Lanka because uh, this is a time of unprecedented crisis uh, on all fronts in Sri Lanka. And uh, as Sara very well knows, she arrived in April to take up her post here and went straight into isolation and quarantine and experienced firsthand how life has changed for us here uh, uh, across the globe, really, but especially for us in Sri Lanka, where instead of being welcomed with the usual uh, of pageantry and fanfare. She was uh, in uh, isolation for the two weeks mandatory at the time. So for all of us, uh, this has been, these two years have been uh, a time of great change. And in fact, change that we never thought to see in our lifetimes. Um, so, and uh, we have, we are very lucky that we have today four very different types of uh, area expertise from our panelists, from law to nanotechnology to uh, uh, diplomacy and foreign policy initiatives, and of course, uh, the core of the pandemic focus in uh, medicine. So this is exactly what this is supposed to be uh, by the French Institute, a melting pot of ideas and uh, a jumping off point really to take this forward, uh, especially because we are finding our way in a, uh, in a uh, time where there is no plan or no uh, roadmap really because this has never happened in our lifetimes. So uh, without more ado, let me invite, uh, let me introduce to you the format of the discussion today. Uh, we thought we would have a round table discussion where uh, each of our four panelists would uh, give us their thoughts uh, for about uh, 10 minutes or so on uh, the first question. And then uh, once we finish, we would have some comments on each other's presentations because uh, we don't want to uh, waste that opportunity. We have got to pick the brains of uh, uh, the foremost experts in their fields uh, on this occasion. And then uh, we go to our second round table question um, and we will wind up with any questions from the participants. So our first question, and uh, this is something I would pose to all the panelists, uh, but first to Dr. Karana Senaratna, uh, then we will have Professor Viranja Karnaratna, uh, Dr. Nogegoda comes third, and uh, uh, Dr. Kadira's uh, videoed um, input will be uh, sourced at the last. So, uh, Dr. Kalan, if I can pose the first question to you, uh, what are the observable changes over the past two years in your field of expertise? I know you are an expert on international law and relations, and, but you have chosen to speak today on the aspects of law and education and the changes you have seen, the impact and consequences of the COVID pandemic in your area of expertise. Uh, can you hear me, Shamali? Uh, yes, yes, very yes, much. Thanks. Clear. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Shamali, and, and thanks, Anna, for that introduction. Um, and also to uh, Alliance Frances for this very kind uh, sort of invitation. Um, you've selected a very important topic uh, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, the pandemic has been disastrous for a lot of people at many levels, that's quite clear. Uh, but it's also a complex uh, phenomenon. And the issue with complex phenomena is that they sort of throw up very uh, interesting and also puzzling uh, questions and lead to very uh, uh, contradictory sort of uh, uh, consequences. Um, so it's, one has to be always very mindful of, of what's, what's happening uh, at that particular moment. Um, I'll set out a few brief observations uh, relating to the question that you raised about what kind of changes I've seen uh, during the past two years and the impact uh, of what has happened. Um, and I'll refer to some, some of these points, firstly, as an academic, um, engaged in uh, teaching at a state university in Sri Lanka, and also as, as a law academic, uh, someone who's uh, an observer of uh, the legal political developments. Um, 
as an academic, uh, in very general terms, um, and if I were to start with the positives or the positive sort of looking dimensions of, uh, uh, of the pandemic, um, the first point I would raise is online teaching. Uh, online teaching has been uh, quite a revelation uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of those, especially in the humanities and social sciences uh, discipline, uh, which I am related to as, as a member of the arts faculty. Um, there was a lot of reluctance uh, initially when we were, I think, uh, introduced to this idea of having to teach uh, online. And this was in March 2020. Um, and that reluctance was based on, I mean, was for good reasons. I mean, there were good reasons why um, a lot of academics uh, were a bit reluctant, um, questions of equality, inequality, and so on, and I'll, I'll touch on them later. Uh, but also there was this sense that, you know, what on earth is online teaching? What on earth is Zoom? Uh, I had not really heard about Zoom uh, until then, uh, or anything. I mean, the idea of online teaching had not crossed uh, our minds. Um, so I think there was that negative response with which we started. Uh, but today, what has happened is online teaching has become the main form of teaching. Um, and I think it is here to stay uh, for a considerable period, or at least uh, online teaching would be would run uh, on a parallel track along with you know face to face uh, teaching. And uh, there is uh, some equalizing that that happens um, when one is engaged uh, with the students online. Uh, I feel that sometimes the boundaries between the teacher and the student, uh, uh, they are broken. Um, just to give a simple example, I mean, for long years, we've seen how students come before us, make presentations, PowerPoint presentations, um, uh, having difficulties with you know, opening the documents and so on. But here, after so many years, we've suddenly realized how, how very equal we are in, in terms of handling these, these things. You get lecturers, uh, uh, many of us who uh, have problems uh, dealing with you know, online uh, material. Um, we speak on and on, but uh, we then realize we are on mute. Uh, so these kinds of things make us uh, very humble sort of creatures at the end of the day. Uh, so there's that equalizing effect. And also another point is uh, assessment. Uh, this idea of open book online exams, uh, I think that has had a, a positive impact on some students. Uh, and it's, it's great that, you know, uh, this idea uh, is now, um, is not new uh, for many of us anymore. Um, we've had this system where we expect students to, uh, you know, memorize things. Uh, and we used to say that this only happened in schools, but when you come to university, you realize that this is exactly the same thing that's happening in the university as well. Um, and we also have this system, especially if you take legal education, for example, uh, around the world, uh, especially in Europe and uh, various other places. I mean, the basic, something basic as taking a constitution or a statute book into the examination hall. Uh, now that's something that is unheard of in Sri Lanka. So um, uh, we have now the system of students doing online exams. Um, uh, they are exposed to the idea of open book uh, exams. Uh, they have a lot of material with them uh, to answer questions and the expectation of greater critical thinking, independent thinking. Uh, I think that that has been a positive uh, dimension. And some students have genuinely sort of um, benefited from this whole experience. But then of course there are other negatives. Um, and one broad point to be raised is that, you know, wherever there is this relationship between student and the teacher, uh, there is no substitute. At the end of the day, there is no substitute uh, for face-to-face -face, um, lectures and interactions. Uh, today, I think uh, some of us uh, uh, would um, value 
face-to-face uh, -face interactions uh, far more uh, than we did um, during the post, uh, sort of the pre-COVID uh, era. Um, so that deeper connection, the bond that you create with students, uh, just the simple idea of you know going to class, you know, raising a few questions, having a very interesting and engaging discussion with them. Uh, uh, is a fantastic idea. It's, it's, it's something that uh, one is waiting for. Uh, it's not that you can't do these things online, but um, it's, it's, it's never the same. Uh, secondly, on a more serious note, of course, there is this uh, the widening gap between you know, uh, those who are able to uh, access instruments, uh, internet connection, so on, uh, and those who cannot. Um, so there's a growing inequality that is taking place um, uh, between students, uh, perhaps between different faculties, uh, between certain geographical uh, locations, uh, between countries in terms of, you know, educational sort of uh, capacities and, and, and uh, the, the, the uh, technological sort of improvements that, that we are exposed to. Uh, along with that, along with this, uh, I mean, we get, we hear the horror stories of students uh, who are unable to access uh, the internet, uh, who have to leave their homes and, you know, live with, you know, uh, their uncles and aunts who are in a different place, uh, who's, you know, who have better access to the internet. Uh, we have students who are not doing exams because they simply cannot, you know, uh, cope with uh, online uh, teaching. There is uh, online fatigue that is creeping in. So all of that is also taking place at the same time. Uh, thirdly, uh, as negatives, I mean, this push towards doing something uh, somehow, uh, this, this uh, rhetoric of efficiency, and I think... Uh, uh, one of my colleagues at the faculty, uh, Hasini Lekamvasam, wrote a very interesting chapter on, on this particular issue. Uh, we've begun to sort of, I think, question what free education is in, in, in the current context. Uh, there is a move towards, you know, thinking more in terms of efficiency. You expect the student to do something, uh, get your connection somehow and engage in this process, uh, whereas the idea of rights, uh, the right to, you know, uh, uh, the internet or the right to sort of uh, proper educational facilities uh, is completely ignored. So that has been uh, a significant problem uh, for a lot of students, uh, especially at the school level. I think uh, university level, there is some sense that, you know, students uh, are able to cope up with uh, online education now, but uh, this has been uh, a terrible problem, I think, at, at schools. And we hear stories about, you know, online tuition uh, starting at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, uh, I mean, just imagine how uh, things are going uh, at the moment for, for a lot of students. Uh, then, uh, finally, there is also, uh, on the other side, there is this misunderstanding of the concept of online open book assessments uh, and the students i i feel uh, now prefer online uh, or at least many students suddenly prefer online uh, examinations for the wrong reasons um, and that's unfortunate even today there was this discussion uh, of student representatives coming and uh, informing the faculty that uh, that that they are against the idea of uh, having face-to-face uh, -face or normal examinations in the university. And there was not a single um, important reason uh, that was uh, given. Uh, the reason is quite clear. I think students now feel that they just need to, I mean, the only moment when they need to uh, go through the reading material and, and, and the course material is when they get the assignment online or when they're informed that the paper is uploaded. Uh, if they are asked to uh, come back for the examination, I think they would have to do a lot of uh, studying uh, before they uh, get to the hall. So um, 
so that is one of the unfortunate sort of uh, repercussions uh, of uh, online education. Um, as a legal academic, I'll just raise two points and, and, and conclude. Um, while there are a lot of changes taking place uh, in terms of law, I mean, different types of laws uh, or certain legal disciplines, you know, uh, certain forms of the law developing in, in uh, significant ways. Uh, I've seen, especially in Sri Lanka, that the pandemic has been, I mean, used as a pretext uh, for the further abuse of rights. Uh, the abuse of rights has, has taken place amidst uh, the pandemic and they've used the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, to justify many of the uh, intrusions into uh, the lives of uh, a lot of people. Uh, the freedoms relating to uh, speech expression, the freedom of assembly, uh, the right to a fair trial, the best example being uh, the lawyer Hijazi's Bullah's case, where he was actually asked to stay at home uh, and, and he got a call from the, uh, I think the Ministry of Health uh, saying that, uh, you know, I mean, COVID was used as, as, as you know, uh, to, to, So, uh, sorry, so uh, Hijaz's case is, is one good example. And um, secondly, uh, the pandemic has not stopped, uh, especially the state from uh, promoting, uh, firstly, authoritarian rule. I think the pandemic has uh, sometimes made them feel that uh, there should be greater authoritarianism. Uh, you get the examples of the 20th Amendment, uh, the Port City Bill, which, I mean, how, these, uh, these bills were introduced, uh, the lack of uh, democratic freedom to sort of debate, um, the lack of consultation, um, all of those problems have been, uh, have continued even amidst uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And then uh, the perpetuation of uh, ethnic uh, oriented uh, discrimination uh, has also continued. I mean, the perpetuation has, has, has been there. Uh, the impact on the Muslim community, for example, has been quite uh, significant. Um, so all these things have continued. And um, if one was to ask this question, so what has changed? Uh, I think a lot has changed and also nothing has changed. Um, some of the ways in which we think about things, the human being, in particular, I wonder whether uh, there has been uh, too much of change uh, in, in that species. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop here and I'll uh, continue the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senaratna, for those very insightful comments. Uh, and in particular, I think uh, your comments on online teaching uh, are particularly relevant to uh, the Advanced Frances. Uh, most of our uh, teaching has been online for the past two years. Uh, and I think uh, any academic on uh, listening to us today will share those same concerns. And I note particularly your concerns with regard to uh, the curtailment of personal rights and freedoms and the way in which uh, the state has uh, perhaps used COVID and the pandemic uh, as an exercise to, uh, as an excuse to really um, carry out uh, certain um, initiatives which would not have been possible uh, in a non-pandemic situation. So thank you very much. And uh, we are very glad to see that Dr. Viranjay is with us. Uh, we didn't think you would be able to join us. So uh, very happy to see you, Dr. Viranjay. And may I invite you uh, to share with us your thoughts? And could I just remind you of the question again of uh, what the observable changes have been in the past two years uh, in the field of your expertise of nanotechnology? and the impact and consequences of the COVID pandemic uh, that you see in your field. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Shali. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for first calling me and inviting me for this. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so basically, yes, can hear I'm, a, I'm a, uh, not a product, but uh, I've worked at Peradini University since 1979. Uh, that's way before uh, uh, Kalana probably was at the university uh, ever planning to even teach. 
but i uh, pardon me for uh, shifting the conversation to something very different uh, nothing to do with online teaching or what pandemic has taught us and forced us to do online teaching that's not what my conversation is i think the pandemic or the topic that i'm going to discuss has been a blessing in disguise because the technology is sweeping the planet and uh, unmistakably and inevitably uh, we will have different conversations in another 5 to 10 years and the topics that we think are cumbersome and problematic today uh, will be minuscule not that they are minuscule per se but because there are so many other sweeping factors uh, uh, taking over the planet uh two years was what shamali was the question uh, two years is a hard thing and and two years in technology is 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 a is a blink of an eyelid um so uh, uh while it's agreeing that two years is the time of the pandemic we have had and i think pandemic has been a great opportunity notwithstanding the loss of human life notwithstanding the human suffering that the virus has caused uh we unknown to many people on this planet technology has marched forward in such a fashion that today or when we come out of this pandemic we would be living in a different world um uh, you know uh, we, we we can go into a number of areas and i i hope uh, some of you in the know will Uh, or at least would be inclined to to agree with me now the the window that i would like to talk however is pre pandemic in areas of science and technology it's about a 10 year window i would settle for now that's not to uh dilute the fact that as a human species homo sapiens sapiens that's who we are we have lived in caves 15000 years ago uh where you know we had uh, uh color neutral skin color uh probably we were all brown or black and then we evolved and the humans as a species became white the skin color white only very very recently right and 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 that's only because of environmental factors uh when people moved out of africa uh we were all dark and then when we came to europe there was less sunshine and less pigment production on our skin and the genes got uh changed mutated and it was more desirable that you have white skin if you were living in the northern hemisphere and if you were living or continue to migrate towards the southern hemisphere it was desirable that we had dark skin so that's how things got separated but this has led to discriminations and you can call it anything you like um uh, and it hasn't even stopped today uh, much of the reach not although i'm not a human rights activist or even a proponent of any kind i think the root cause of that is the inequality of human beings as led to the need for human rights uh we are fundamentally unequal depending on where you live what you speak and what gdp your country possesses so um um uh, the the area i i want to talk about two things just before i wind up because i i understand there are time constraints here um sera told me it's about a one hour program so i'm fully fully aware of my time constraints and look if you look at if you look at uh, if you look at material science we have advanced so much nanotechnology is part of material science it has impacted medicine uh, although many many uh, laymen are anaware how nanotechnology has impacted medicine nano medicine is a big branch of medicine and it has enhanced 
the medical uh, products, the tablets, the medicines that we we take. Uh, nanotechnology has moved into that. And agriculture is one another area where nanotechnology has moved in. Smart agriculture, Sri Lanka tried to do quote unquote smart agriculture, but we failed. We have come to not too smart agriculture now, using chemical fertilizer to the fullest, but smart agriculture is important because technology has moved in how the population is increasing, how do you continue to feed the planet? So if you don't increase the food production without uh, impacting the environment, without impacting the number of hectares that we cultivate, uh, we are going to be in trouble and hence the need for smart agriculture and there are lots of innovations in nanotechnology that have uh, 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 taken a big role in smart agriculture. And uh, secondly, materials, smart materials. Uh, unknown to you, the motor car, the automobile that you drive is much lighter than the automobile that your parents drove. Much lighter because thanks to the, the, the rubber material or the polymer material inside your car, in, not, with, not to mention the, the outer metal, because they are all uh, uh, mixed with nanomaterial, which gives them extra strength and lighter weight. So that's the key thing about nanotechnology is that it can give impart lightness of material weight whilst enhancing its properties. Okay, and then uh, uh, now <laughs> now if you look at uh, uh, also, uh, uh, you've seen tennis on television at least, um, the females playing tennis. If you noticed the female, the speed of the female tennis serve has now increased so much. Some of the females can serve as fast as males on the tennis court. The reason for that is not that females have not gained strength physically, they may have. I'm not going to argue with that. But one of the most important reasons is that the rackets that are produced today, uh, which have been, uh, which are plastic rackets, have carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes make it lighter and stronger, which has increased uh, uh, the serve speed of female tennis players. So, you know, you can go into so many areas where nanotechnology, which can be considered as the fifth, sixth industrial revolution. Um, if you remember in 1825 in the city of Manchester, we had the first industrial revolution. And then since that, we have had a number of industrial revolutions and we went through electronic revolutions. Forget what Sri Lanka has been doing. We have probably not done anything in this, any of these revolutions including the nanotechnology revolution. Uh, hopefully, uh, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, but we've gone through many revolutions. And today, in terms of materials, the revolution is in material science. And material science, the polymers will change the world. Now, shifting completely, is that the total story of technology sweeping the planet? No. Artificial intelligence. Um, which is upon us now uh, in a big way. And pandemic, that's what I said, the pandemic uh, probably was good news for artificial intelligence because when we emerge out of the pandemic, we'll realize that many of the jobs that we were doing would have been replaced by machines. Um, then you'll ask me, why would you allow such a technology to pervade our, our planet? Remember, the meaning of the word technology, in addition to the fact that it is a scientific innovation, is the fact that technologies are meant to earn money. If a technology doesn't earn money, it's not a technology. You can call it a technology, but it's really not a technology. So humans are very fond of making money. So if, even if at the cost of us losing our jobs, the technology will sleep, uh, sweep our planet. And uh, in another 
you know, right about now, maybe in another 10 years, all automobiles in Europe would be self-driven cars. Uh, I don't know whether Sri Lanka would ever get there, but I, I don't want to get into that uh, scenario. All automobiles in another 10 years are projected to be self-driven cars in Europe and in North America, uh, meaning that advanced computation is required. So in the midst of all this artificial intelligence, who are probably and very likely going to take over the jobs, and that's a bad word to use. It's not taking over the job. Technology doing the job it wants. If a man, human cannot compete, uh, you're out of a job. So what do we do? We are going to be 9, 12 billion on this planet when artificial intelligence sweeps the planet. So what are we going to do at that time? So I propose that, uh, uh, you know, th there's a concept called deep learning. In, in, in computers. Deep learning is that if you give a trillion data points to a computer, computer can process these trillion data points much better than our human brain does. Uh, human brain cannot process one trillion data points. Now, that's why in the last round, when the world chess champion lost to a machine, lost to a computer, the world chess champion lost to a computer, the chess game. The champion cried. He cried because he was humiliated in front of a machine. But the machine never had the need to be congratulated. So clearly, the machines are not capable of empathy, love. We are. So I think even if machines take over, uh, I mean, if you, if you really look at uh, the way our job market has turned, you know, uh, companies which work on the interface of uh, digital technology and human resources, they're making huge profits because the cost of labor is going down because you don't need people to, uh, to work as much because the machines have replaced them. So in that climate, uh, I think going forward, and the machines have replaced many of us, um, um, not to um, say this um, as a pun, um, Shamli, uh, many of the lawyers would lose their jobs because... Um, I was the, just the, thinking that. The standard practice of law doesn't require, uh, unless you're going to courts and defending a case in front of a judge, um, where the human element may be involved, empathy may be involved, the way you love may be involved. Uh, you don't need uh, a lawyer for many of the routine work that we do, such as uh, uh, land cases and you know, giving deeds to a land and all that. All that. Many of the doctors would lose their jobs uh, other than uh, talented uh, surgeons. Uh, so I'm not saying, I mean, this is not to say they're losing their jobs. They're going to rearrange, reconfigure the world we live in. So what can we do more that the machines cannot do is that we can love. We can have empathy. So let us increase the number of jobs for counselors. You know, machines can never be good counselors, right? Because they have no empathy. They cannot love. So I think we can be creative. One example that I quoted, we can be creative. We cannot stop a technology from sweeping the planet because that technology will make uh, more money. All nations will be richer than they are today because uh, they will do business at a lower cost than they are doing today. So the excess money can be used in a productive way. So that's uh, what I want to say. And one uh, more thing that I want to say is, um, you know, in addition to all this, there is a concept called, you have heard the word anyway, maybe without understanding what it is, virtual reality. You know, virtual reality is that uh, you can flip back and forth between realities of virtual versus physical and feel no difference between your virtual reality and the physical reality that you live in. And that aspect is increasing now. So in another hundred years, Kids would have great grandchildren 
the great grandparents, not you, not any one of us in this audience. In another hundred years, kids would have great grandkid uh, parents who would wear a headband and live in a virtual reality world and flit back and forth into the physical world as if both worlds are equally real and equally enjoyable. So that's something very far into the future. And uh, let me stop at this point because uh, the speaker before me and my uh, conversation were diametrically, uh, I shouldn't say opposed, but then we talked on very different subjects. Thank you, Shamli. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Vayanja, I wouldn't say diametrically opposed, but uh, when I agreed to moderate this uh, panel discussion, I didn't expect to be scared witless because you have now told me that I will be without a job uh, in the near future. And as an employment lawyer, I must say that's a very scary thought. Uh, but thank you. I think you made a lot of valid points and uh, it's not diametrically opposed to what Dr. Senaratna was saying. I think Dr. Senaratna also made the fundamental point in relation to education, especially uh, that we have had to rethink our approach to the way we look at education and we deliver education. Uh, and that I think is the gist of your uh, uh, argument as well in relation to a very different area of nanotechnology. Uh, but I must say, I'm really scared if you think that uh, if you, if uh, I have to believe that uh, automated Where transportation Marikou? will take place in Sri Lanka, especially if we have okay, uh, automated tuk-tuks and automated motorbikes. I shall stop uh, getting on the road at all and live virtually. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Viranja. I think you have given us a lot of uh, um, think, uh, food for thought and, and for future uh, further discussion later. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Nuge Guda to um, explain to us uh, from a very different point of view again, uh, from medicine and not nanomedicine, what the observable changes have been over the past two years, especially with re related to the in, uh, in relation to the pandemic and what the consequences have been. Thank you, doctor. May I invite you now? Thank you. Yeah, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I will live. I will project it now. Ivana, can you make it possible for Dr. Nukutu to share the presentation? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I will speak to you uh, quite a different one, but uh, about COVID-19 complications and deaths due to uh, COVID due to the site, what is called the cytokine storm. Now, I will explain that as I go on. Now, the cytokine storm is to the production of copious amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines due to chronic inflammation. Now, chronic inflammation is a condition which happens inside the body for any disease, even acute illnesses, there is a type. But chronic inflammation is a condition where the inflammation goes on and on for a very long time. So now there are sites, four main sites where chronic inflammation occurs with the production of copious amounts of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. One is the oral cavity. So the oral health has to be, I mean, it has to be a healthy oral uh, cavity because if not, that is one or important site where there's pro-inflammatory cytokines are produced, often uh, not realized by many of the people. Because even in the United uh, States of America, according to the Center for Disease Control, among the adult, adult population, about 30% uh, have a poor oral health. So now, if that is so, that is one factor which promote COVID inflammation infection and the inflammation and also all the complications. That is one. Then next one is unhealthy gut bacteria. Now we have over 1,000 trillion gut bacteria inside our intestine, which is much more than the cells in our body. 
Now, they, they, are, they have done studies and they have found, now, for example, one study, they took 15 COVID patients and compared to 15 non-COVID normal people, and there's a marked difference in the gut bacteria, where the COVID patients had very unhealthy gut bacteria. So that is another thing to remember. Then factors which promote unhealthy bacteria. Now, when you take a very high sugar, sugary drink, fizzy drinks, like a, a small can has about eight to 10 teaspoons of sugar. Then fast foods, French fries, white bread, white rice. So these are high glycemic index foods. That means uh, soon after you take the food, the sugar, blood sugar level increases rapidly to a high level. So that also is another factor. Then the third one is central obesity. That is, you, you have a huge tummy like, right? So the, where the waist is more than half your height. So actually, if your height is uh, five feet, that is uh, 60 inches, the waist should be 30 inches or less. If not, uh, you are having central obesity. Now, there is fat. Now, when there is central obesity, there is a lot of fat inside the abdomen, around the liver, the pancreas, the intestines. Now, this is called the visceral fat, and that visceral fat also acts like a factory producing these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Then the fourth major place, unhealthy lungs. So if the lungs are always under, having chronic inflammation, that also can be a site for production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, one important factor in Sri Lanka, is a lot of people use mosquito nets, and they don't wash it often. It's unclean, you see. Now, there are about four or five patients who are suffering for asthma, from asthma for many years, and I got them to wash their nets once a week, and uh, they managed to stop taking the drugs, and the asthma also went off, right? Then also burning mosquito coils. Now, again, that smoke is very bad for the health of the lungs. Then incense and joysticks. Again, now, even at street corners, people are selling these joysticks. Now, that smoke is even worse than the Cigarette smoke, the Chinese and British studies have found to be very dangerous. Then, of course, obviously smoking. Then uh, the cytokine storm. So where there is a cytokine storm, is there are a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood. And, uh, and in COVID, this is cytokine storm is something which happens uh, in serious cases. Uh, which leads to lung failure, and there's uh, poor oxygenation, and they die. Then also another one is the clotting of blood inside the body, inside the arteries, inside the veins, the blood can clot. So now that, again, is another factor which uh, is the result of these cytokine storm. Now, there's another very serious condition realized, what is called the long COVID syndrome, which is now coming into focus. Now, this is after recovering from initial disease. These people, for many months, they can have shortness of breath, fatigue, brain fog. That means they can't think properly. Now, just a few days ago, the medical news today pointed out a very dangerous uh, situation. The brain damage markers, that is the blood test they do to assess the brain damage, was greater in these, uh, in these patients with severe COVID than those with Alzheimer's disease. Now, just imagine, Alzheimer's develops when they are very old and loss of memory. I mean, they don't know any but their surroundings. That's a very, I mean, pathetic status. But now in these COVID patients, these blood markers were more than even with uh, Alzheimer's. So we, we have to wait and see what's going to happen. Because again, inflammation, there's neuro in the brain, neuroinflammation and neuro degeneration, that means of the brain and the nerves. So this is very alarming. Uh, also, about a week ago, they reported a family physician, a female uh, 
middle-aged female from UK. After recovering from COVID-19, she had severe problems with concentration and multitasking. Now, for example, now she did, she had forgotten the word for carrots. So she described it as long orange pointed things. So this is very serious. So this, I mean, this endemic epidemic with so many people are being affected. So this is very frightening. Now, uh, shall I do the prevention later? Or because this is the second part of my uh, presentation. Uh, to the second, uh, the final round of discussion. Okay, I, I will do it uh, later. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. I think I found that a very short and sharp assessment of uh, what has been happening, and some of it really, I must say, was presented very logically. And I had not realized myself before, even though we have done a lot of reading on this. So, thank you very much for those thought-provoking comments, and. I think especially uh, the connection with obesity and uh, unhealthy gut bacteria, bad oral health, bad lung health, I think these are uh, really markers for long-term intervention uh, if we are going to be the pandemic in the long run. So thank you very much. And may I ask Ivana now to uh, give us the presentation sent by Dr. Kadir because he can't be with us today. Dr. Kadir Petegunda is a diplomat and a foreign policy expert, and he has very kindly sent us his thoughts uh, on a video recording. Thank you to Alliance Francais for the invitation to talk, and uh, thanks to Vijita Mama for uh, arranging it. Um, I wish to briefly highlight uh, two sets of developments during the pandemic. Uh, the first uh, occurred very early when, it, um, when the pandemic had an apocalyptic kind of element. So for much of recent history, humans living in the West enjoyed fairly privileged lives uh, in comparison to the great mass of beings that inhabit this planet. Uh, on the other hand, people in the global South faced regular threats to their security by way of disease, famine, and war. Uh, and for most non-human animals, life ranged only from the brute freedom of the wild to the torture of factory farms. COVID-19, if for a brief period only, shifted the West out of the comfortable, protected slumber that it had been in since World War II. It broke one of the subconscious pillars of human exceptionalism, that our privileged quality of life is not just fact, but a self-justifying fact. It had been assumed that humans live better than animals because for whatever reason, religious or pseudoscientific, we deserve to. Corona is a wake-up call that all humanity is just another species of animal. We are part of a food chain where other, other uh, organisms can get the better of us. We can catch diseases from our fellow animals, and we too may be killed in large numbers. Through the combined lessons of a reality check on our mortality and the first-hand insight into the precarious existence that most non-human animals endure, this crisis could, over time, trigger an ushering in of a new global relationship between humans and animals. And the second area that uh, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, is an impact that occurred later when the pandemic uh, was gauged as not being so uh, catastrophic. And here we see pre-existing tensions uh, re-arise, uh, but within a pandemic context. So firstly, there's the growing distrust between the people uh, and what many call the establishment. Uh, this is something that had manifested uh, in everything from the Black Lives Matter protests uh, and the counter protests uh, to the rise of Trump uh, and Bernie Sanders. It's now manifested in global anti-mandate protests. And governments have exacerbated this by measures that further control, uh, further the level of control that states have over their populations. And secondly, geopolitics. As, what, as happened with the GFC, the global financial crisis, the East's rise in comparison to the West 
uh, has accelerated during the pandemic. China's economy has grown. And while the US is, has grown as well, this growth has not been felt by the majority of its population. While America's billionaires added $2 trillion in wealth during the pandemic, the middle and working class faced unprecedented crises, like the threat of mass evictions from home. So the pandemic further undermined the triumphalism of the 1990s, where it was thought that liberal market economics had won history. We've seen strong state responses, whether from one party states like China to democracies like Australia and New Zealand, have greater success in containing the pandemic than the laissez-faire libertarian approach uh, we've seen in certain states in the uh, United States, for example. We've also seen the global south step up in terms of vaccine manufacture and donation. And this has further fueled the growing ideological competition between great powers, one that we've not seen since the Cold War. Sarivana, was it the end of the video? Uh, yes, it is the end of the video. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I think Dr. Kadiru raised some very valuable points. And I find it interesting that uh, he made the fundamental point that Dr. Uh, Beranja also made of the inequality between the haves and the have-nots having increased during the pandemic. And I think uh, Dr. Cullen also made this point in relation to uh, um, education. So we see some common themes emerging in the very different types of uh, expert, uh, expert opinions that we have had today. Uh, due to the shortness of time, let me go immediately to table two question. And thank you very much. Let's hope that we can exchange some thoughts uh, uh, between uh, our different uh, experts later on, if we have time. Could we just keep this a little bit shorter, perhaps about five minutes per speaker? Uh, the question two is foreseeable changes over the next two years in your area of expertise and what should we do to face these changes as human beings and societies? So may I again ask you to start off, uh, Dr. Cullen? Uh, we would love to have switched things around, uh, but due to the shortness of time, we just stick to the same order of uh, proceedings. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shamali. Uh, just a couple of changes. Uh, one is, uh, and this leads to what I think Professor uh, Branja uh, talked about, which was very interesting. Um, this idea that technology sort of will uh, develop exponentially and, and we'll be living in, a, in an entirely different world, something that is unimaginable. But along with that, my only point, I mean, it's, it's uh, the only point that I would raise um, is that the human miseries, um, all the darker sides of humanity uh, will also get transported to the online uh, format. And this, hap this is already happening, I mean, in, in Sri Lanka and perhaps um, in other places also. Um, in the education sector, we get the new phenomenon of uh, online ragging. Uh, I recently heard the case of um, uh, university uh, in the north where students are harassed uh, online through WhatsApp. Uh, so rag ragging has shifted. And my main point um, here is that while human beings develop uh, scientifically, there is no doubt about that. And we've seen the developments over the past uh, decades. Uh, and as Professor Kamarath said, uh, the developments will be uh, significant going forward. Whether the human beings develop ethically um, is questionable. And that's, that's a point that um, certain humanists would uh, want to disagree with, but uh, it's, it's a very um, a critical point that uh, uh, we have to face. Um, and during the past two years, I mean, if you ask me whether the thinking of human beings um, has changed, I mean, that's why I ended my previous sort of intervention 
by saying that I, I'm not sure whether that has happened. Uh, then again, another uh, impact on education is that we might see a situation where um, the availability of resources uh, would remain the same, whereas the expectations of the universities or expectations uh, from the universities uh, would be uh, increased and there would be a mismatch in these two. Uh, because now what could happen in the immediate future is that uh, we would be perhaps asked to uh, cater to a broader segment of students, a, a wide number of students, but with the same kinds of facilities. Why? Because online education has made that quite possible and convenient. Uh, <clears throat> and this is something that, I mean, we personally face um, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the law department, where we have uh, uh, an increased intake, uh, but uh, we have classes uh, which are adequate to sort of uh, 15, 50 students, whereas our batches have now increased up to 70. Um, uh, so, so these are some of the real sort of changes that, that we are facing and real challenges that we are confronting. Uh, what needs to be done? <clears throat> I'm not really sure as to uh, how um, uh, specific solutions can be proposed because things keep changing uh, on a daily basis. Um, but perhaps, I think another point that Professor Karnanath raised, which is that, you know, uh, human beings uh, are the ones who are ultimately able to sort of uh, empathize. Um, uh, that is the species which is able to sort of uh, uh, love the other human being and, and nature in general. So um, inculcating the uh, importance of some of these values that, that we've been talking about for a long time, uh, empathy, equality, um, and in terms of law, I mean, the rule of law, not rule by law, but rule of law, and so on. These, these would need to, uh, you know, teaching in these areas would need to continue and, and uh, uh, perhaps greater focus on the idea of education, uh, free education, especially in Sri Lanka. Um, all of these things would need to be sort of rethought. Um, and then finally, I mean, I would like to sort of end by suggesting that um, we would need to be more concerned about, you know, developing a conscious human being. Um, uh, and this is a bit of a spiritual sort of um, idea uh, where we sort of rethink whether we are, you know, conscious human beings, whether we are mindful enough to cope with the challenges uh, that have come our way and that will come our way. Um, whether we are engineered enough uh, within, I mean, we have a lot of technological development going on. Uh, the external world, the world that is external to us is developing. Uh, we have better machines. Uh, we live like, I mean, we are almost living like zombies, you know, with phones and so on. But uh, has inner engineering, uh, has inner engineering happened? Uh, so uh, uh, that's that's the point on which uh, I would like to end. Um, but it will certainly be, uh, as the Chinese say, very interesting times moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karan. I think those were very um, important uh, conclusions that you drew and also your solutions. And the same uh, principle that Dr. Viranja spoke of in terms of humanity. Uh, the importance of uh, the humanness uh, versus artificial intelligence and technological interventions. I think these are very interesting and important uh, points taking, uh, to take forward into our discussion today and uh, in the coming days. Uh, may I ask you, Professor Viranj, if uh, you could share your thoughts on what you foresee as changes in the next two years and uh, how you see us uh, as human beings overcoming uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, I must say you've been a, a remarkably excellent host, um, talking about things that uh, uh, that all of us have collectively talked about. And thank you so much for it. And you know, I want to uh, talk to you that uh, increasingly philosophers and scientists 
are talking about the fact that we as humans, this planet may be a simulation, which means uh, entirely we are a computer program and there is a computer or computers or trillion computers running somewhere. And then we are part of that virtual reality. And uh, whilst you or anybody may not agree to it, there are uh, certainly no reasons why we or certainly cannot find any, any evidence that we cannot disagree with it. Uh, we are a, just a computer program unleashed unleashed by uh, some advanced computer. So which means that uh, if this is to be the case, we are simulations, there are thousands, trillions and trillions of simulations all over the universe. And we are just one of them. And this is like, take Microsoft computer, Microsoft program. Part of the Microsoft, we all, let's say in Sri Lanka, we use, we open, Thousands of people are using different aspects of the Microsoft. Similarly, thousands of planets and civilizations are going through a simulated existence. And that's why I talked about virtual reality, which in another hundred years will come very, very close to our physical reality. We won't know any difference between virtual reality and physical reality, and we'll enjoy both. So, uh, what I want to say is, if machines are going to take over, and let's uh, let's not get too hung up on the fact that whether we are a, a simulation or not, uh, let's hope hope that we are not, and let's hope that we are really physical, and you know we can touch each other, and uh, there is real blood circulating in our veins, and uh, that no computer program can ever simulate. Let's hope that's to be the case, but. Even if machines take over this planet, our only known path, uh, planet, uh, I think we talk about human rights uh, all the time. Um, human rights violations, um, you know, coming up with laws, this and that. And I would challenge that. I'm not saying human rights are not important. That's not purpose of my challenge, I would challenge that in time to come, we would have, we would need to have a code of human rights for machines. Right? So any forum where, uh, that's why, you know, I, I, I know all of you or some of you are aware of a forum that there was and maybe it still exists called the Friday Forum. Uh, where they discussed matters of human rights and various issues that are very important. And 10 years ago, when I was invited to attend the Friday Forum, I told them, look, if you call me as a technology guy, I would be happy because the Friday Forum as it is, without considering technology, is probably, in my opinion, uh, thought exercise, um, I wouldn't say futility, but certainly something that you need to examine because the way we are going in this planet forward. So uh, again, I said, uh, come up with human rights for machines. We need to, I think that's a critical area and we haven't even come up with human rights for humans. Now we are urgently, will be asked to come up with human rights for machines. Uh, there you have the, the conundrum that we'll face. And the other word that I, I would like to introduce you to is what is called the metaverse. As you know, Facebook changed its name to meta recently, right? Meaning uh, meta is, uh, is, a, is another word for metaverse. Um, yeah, not the time for me to go into this. And in the metaverse, as it is, people live in the metaverse so much that the the let's say your your father the dead father's uh, thought process can be stored if it can be stored in the metaverse you could have a lively relationship with your dead father whose thought process will change and evolve based on 
the ongoing uh, matters in your life. So you can have a meaningful relationship with your dead father. So with that uh, uh, unimaginable thought, um, let's, uh, let me uh, stop the uh, conversation for tonight, Shamali. Thank you so much. Uh, you have given us a very deep uh, focus today to our discussion. And this is the beauty of exchanging ideas. We have had one of our foremost constitutional law experts speaking of the impact of technology on education and a foremost nanotechnology speaking of human rights. So this is why it is important to engage in these discussions because uh, uh, the multifaceted way in which uh, our discussions can evolve and we can contribute to the thought, uh, the thinking that is going on is very important. Thank you. And may I now invite Professor Nugeguda again to present uh, the second part uh, of uh, your very interesting presentation. We look forward to your conclusion. Thank you. Cytokine storm due to COVID-19. Uh, and overcoming mental and psychological problems associated with COVID-19. It's not going. It's not going. Sorry. We can see. Uh, so I mentioned about the oral health. So brushing, uh, not only brushing, but from, uh, get a lot of uh, the toothbrush will not be able to remove particles in between teeth. Then also promote a healthy gut bacteria. So what I mentioned, avoid food, fast food drinks that promote unhealthy gut bacteria, which I presented earlier. Instead of that, you had to eat uh, uh, more rice like parboiled rice, like nadu. We have whole grain wheat products, nuts, seeds, prebiotics. Now, prebiotic means these actually prebiotics are found in fruits, green leaves, vegetables, like colacanthus. These dietary fiber uh, that is the food for the healthy gut bacteria. So, that is uh, very important because that will promote uh, healthy gut bacteria. And uh, so that it will be pre have a preventive effect. Then also, in addition to prebiotics, we had to eat probiotics, like uh, things like yogurt, curd, cheese, tofu, tempeh, then dark chocolate is also good, preferably sugar-free. Now, they, they, now, this uh, fact was well demonstrated. A plant-based diet gives protection against severity of COVID. British Medical Journal uh, presented a study involving 2,884 doctors and nurses who worked with COVID patients from USA, UK, Spain, Italy, France, Germany. They found eating only... Now, there were people who didn't take meat or fish, only... Uh, uh, plant-based diet. Now, they were 73% less likely to experience moderate to severe COVID compared to meat eaters. Now, the plant, now there were, of course, there are people who eat plant as well as fish-based diet. Now, that was little lower, 59% less likely to experience moderate to severe COVID compared to meat eaters. Then very important thing is the healthy gut bacteria also produce what the factor chemical called transforming growth factor. Now this gets absorbed into the blood and it's taken all over the body and it accepts anti-inflammatory effect. So it again promotes that way also. So I said the waist should be less than half high, half your height. So you won't have central obesity because the central obesity, the fat, uh, the visceral fat acts like a factory which produces uh, cytokine, pro inflammatory cytokine. Then of course, wash your mosquito nets to, main, main to ensure the health of the lungs. 
uh, wash your mosquito nets regularly, avoid burning mosquito coils inside joysticks, and also uh, smoking. Then sunlight is important. Paula Drenov says, new evidence shows that getting enough vitamin D may be the most important thing that you can do for your health. Because with this, uh, when you are exposed to sunlight, especially you get the production of serotonin, which causes happiness and also strengthens the immune system. Now, the strong immune system is vital for you to fight any infection, including COVID. Earthing or grounding. Now, this is a new field which has appeared. Direct physical contact of the human body with the surface of the earth. Uh, reduces blood viscosity, improves cardiovascular health, better sleep, reduce um, pain, and feeling of well-being. So actually, if you look at the I will quote from the book I have written. Yeah, actually, it says that actually when you uh, there's direct contact with the earth, uh, there are lots of, uh, the earth surface is teeming with a negatively charged electrons. Now, these cannot enter our body because always we are, we are footwear. Now, the moment we remove footwear or we are in or you sleep on the um, just barefoot, uh, bare, bare body, these all these electrons get into the body and neutralizes the free radicals, which produce pro-inflammation and uh, also pro-inflammatory cytokine. So this is a very useful thing, and this actually helps practically any illness, right? So that is something which has emerged recently. Then living with nature, again, comes to mind. Your stress levels are reduced. Now, for example, Deepak Chopra in his book, Quantum Healing, has said, if I find a green meadow, splash with daisies, and sit down beside a clear running brook, I have found medicine, because nature is man's healer. The medicine he refers to are the endorphins and the serotonin, which are produced in abundance in that mental status. Relaxation. Again, when you are relaxing, a lot of endorphins and serotonin, they are produced, which <clears throat> relaxes, reduces, removes stress from your body and strengthens your immune system. Avoid social media that brings negative psychological status. Watching television, listening to news, watching, listening to teledramas, most of the teledramas, right? All negative about murders, rape, fraud, all these things are early morning when you watch TV or read newspapers. Only these things come in and it, uh, your mind is set to a negative mode. You're under stress. Your immune system collapses. So these are things to avoid. So if you are watching television, watch only comedies because that, of course, with laughter, it enhances your immune system. Sleep. Again, eight hours of sleep in darkness is necessary in darkness because there should be no light. Because when there is darkness, then only the melatonin, which is a very powerful anti-cancer hormone, as well as which promotes sleep, is produced. Laughter. Again, endorphins are produced very healthy. <clears throat> Norman Cousins says that Inside the nucleus, there are DNA changes we can be detected with laughter. Takashi, a Japanese scientist, says watching comedies increases the natural killer cell activity. There are natural killer cells are the cells which are specifically attack cancer cells. Then benefits is, or benefits patients with high blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, cancer. So actually, in American hospitals, um, I think they have healing channels where all the they always they play these uh, sort of uh, comedies and positive, um, which brings a positive mental status. You can see this picture. 
how happy she is with laughter again, endorphin, serotonin, produced in abundance. Living with pets, again, endorphins, serotonins. Love. Now you can see a small, tiny bird being uh, in the hands of this person with loving kindness he's holding. Again, endorphins, serotonins. Now these are like, uh, a Japanese uh, Emoto scientist. On the left-hand side, you get a beautiful formation. Now, he took a sample of water and directed um, positive thoughts like loving kindness to the water and then uh, kept in the freezer. Just before freezing, he took a sample and uh, watched it under the microscope. And this is the formation. The same water, when he directed like anger, and, uh, like negative thoughts, uh, all negative thoughts, the same water took this bizarre shape. Now, you should remember that 80, 70 to 80 percent of our body consists of water. So just imagine that these positive thoughts, negative thoughts, what it effects is going to have inside our body. Social support. Spend a lot of time with family, relations, friends, go on trips, holidays, and more social contact. It is better because it's a buffer against stress and strengthens the immune system. Now, a study on longevity among the elderly. Now, this is a very interesting study. They uh, looked at elderly people. I mean, most of them were having diabetes, uh, heart disease, things like that. But among them, there was a group of people who lived even longer than the average age. Now, what they found is that these people, Early, I mean, when they, they always talk with the milkman, the postman, they spend a lot, lot of time talking. I mean, so the, the longevity, this study, that factor was more important than whether they had diabetes, heart disease, or cancer. So this is a very uh, good example of the social support. Now, the cell phone has destroyed social support. You can see that people going on holidays, but each one is with his or her uh, cell phone and engaging in various games or going to the um, internet. So this is a very sad state of affairs the cell, cell phone has brought. Having a hobby like gardening, crossword puzzles, doing crossword, Sudoku. Now I have said flow state. Now psychologists, actually what they say is, if you are deeply engrossed in whatever you do, even painting or doing some sort of job, um, handiwork, if you are deeply engrossed in that, you get into what's called the flow state, where you are unaware of the surroundings and you are deeply engrossed. So it is actually a like a form of meditation. So that is, again, very ideal to um, get rid of these negative states. Meditation. Here, actually, I got this picture from a Time magazine. Uh, in America, students meditating before they start the day. Then, of course, intermittent fasting again is something which has come into focus. That is, uh, for 16 hours, um, and eight hours only for food. So this is because now actually, uh, about uh, about a month or two months ago, there was a study, a BBC uh, program, and in that they showed that a middle-aged person, he took uh, a breakfast at 9.30, which was, of course, bacon, eggs, uh, toast, butter, jam, things like that. Uh, and when you, now, usually after two hours, the sugar and the fat levels should come back to normalcy after a meal like that. So in this, uh, that this person, particular person, 9.30 a.m. breakfast, it did come back to normalcy. The same meal he took at 9.30 in the night. But after two hours, sugar was still high. After Even after four hours, 
the fat level was still increasing. So that is very important at night. So ideally, if you can stop eating after six in the evening and take your breakfast at least eight o'clock in the morning, you will have at least 14 hours fasting. I think that is another thing which strengthens your immune system. And I mean, it's good for control of all non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and things like that. So I think I will uh, stop with that. And uh, I hope, uh, and we will uh, get to discussion time when I, if there are questions. Thank you. Sorry, thank you it. so much, uh, Dr. Nogi Guda, for that very fascinating presentation. And I think the key takeaway uh, from uh, your presentation for me was that uh, uh, the very simple changes that we can make to our lifestyles to be better able to withstand uh, this pandemic and the effects of the uh, disease. Uh, and also that the common theme that is emerging uh, is the importance of humanity. You speak of love. Uh, Dr. Senaratna speaks of uh, inner engineering and Dr. Veranja speaks of uh, human rights for machines, but before that human rights for human beings. Uh, so perhaps they are, we are beginning to identify the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and I wait uh, um, with great eagerness what uh, our uh, foreign policy expert, Dr. Kadira has to say. Uh, so perhaps Ivana, if you could have the next presentation. Okay. Thank you. In terms of recommendations, um, while uh, every country's situation is different uh, and the democratic rule of various countries' populations is different, uh, one thing I'd uh, recommend is that uh, states prioritize uh, fundamental human rights uh, in their responses. And what I mean uh, by uh, fundamental rights is not just uh, civil and political rights, like the, the right to uh, freedom of movement and the right to assembly and uh, things like that, um, but also uh, the civil and political right of the right to life, economic, social and cultural rights, like the right to health, um, the right to food, the right to shelter. Um, and I think all policies should really um, balance uh, the impact uh, upon those rights of action or inaction. Um, and also, I guess uh, it's important to weigh up uh, what the, the population's uh, thinking is at the moment when it comes to individual rights versus uh, communal rights. Um, which also depends on cultural factors. So thank you very much to Dr. Kadira as well for uh, recording uh, and that presentation for us under extreme uh, pressure, I think. Uh, but again, the common theme that emerges is uh, uh, the importance of human rights and our human nature. Uh, so with that, we wind up our presentations for the day. Uh, due to the lack of time, I don't think we have a lot of time for discussion, but while I invite our participants to post uh, any questions in the chat box uh, so that we can address them to the relevant panelists, uh, could I just ask whether our presenters have any comments on each other's presentations? Uh, Dr. Senarat, any final thoughts on uh, a common theme perhaps that we could take away from uh, today's discussion? Uh, thanks, uh, Shamali. I, I think uh, you sort of summarized uh, the common themes that sort of run through most of these presentations, Shamali. So um, I would like to sort of address a question if, if that's available. But I think this is, I mean, for me, um, uh, this idea of inner engineering of, of, um, of, of a conscious sort of human being um, has been, you know, uh, something that has attracted uh, me very heavily, uh, perhaps largely because of the COVID sort of situation that we are in. Um, uh, but that's, I think, something that, that really, uh, that's something that we 
should take very seriously uh, because how do we cope with uh, the changing external world uh, unless we um, rearrange ourselves or sort of go within and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, insidy ourselves uh, in a different way. Um, so that has been, you know, concern, a more spiritual sort of oriented life. Uh, while agreeing with you know all the points that have been raised by other speakers, um, even Professor Kanaratna, I mean, uh, uh, I think there's a lot to take uh, from uh, his his uh, sort of presentation. Um, I think all of us are going to sort of uh, lose jobs, not just lawyers, doctors, but uh, any I mean, those of us in the uh, academic field. Um, but uh, so it will be interesting. I mean, let's see. Let's see how it how it goes, and let's see how the human being sort of copes with uh, all of that. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Senarat. While we await any other questions, may I ask Dr. Perancha whether you have any inputs, uh, especially on the aspects of mindfulness and inner uh, engineering that Dr. Kalan speaks of in relation to uh, your uh, thoughts on the fact that we are all part of this great simulation. Uh, but also your comments on the importance of humanity. How would you respond to uh, the thoughts that have been emerged? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, thanks, Shamli. Uh, you know, uh, at the turn of this century, in 18, uh, sorry, uh, 1999, uh, 31st of uh, uh, December, 1999, uh, uh, onset of 2000, I am an avid reader of New York Times. So New York Times editorial uh, had uh, had uh, uh, an editorial where it said in 1899, uh, so it said, look, we propose that the world is so sick, world is so bad, world is so ungovernable, world has no hope that we would like to break it down and rebuild again. By the way, in 1899, onset of 1900s, New York Times editorial wrote the same thing. World is so ungovernable, world has lost its meaning that we would like to rebuild it. So I think chaos is part of us. Uh, we, we, we like utopia, utopian society, but chaos is part of us. And the, the, the substance that I described is part of that chaos. That describes our, our existence. Um, so in, within this chaos, uh, how we handle ourselves and how we define us as a species um, will obviously, you know, in another, uh, I wouldn't want to have it to happen in another 100,000 years, but perhaps in a longer horizon that we would change or we would disappear and a new species would emerge. Um, so uh, thanks to then all our discussions about human rights for this and human rights for that. Mustn't forget that we are just one species who seems to be controlling the planet today. And there were species before us who did the same thing. So uh, there would be species after us and, you know, and we are in that flux and chaos. So let us find meaning within that framework and uh, understand that we are in a journey going forwards and nothing remains the same for more than 10 years. Every 10 years, we redefine ourselves. Thank you. Today's discussion because there are no questions from the audience, but we will be posting this on our YouTube channel uh, so hopefully we will have some responses to share with you. I think what has emerged uh, really from the discussion, which has been very diverse, very valuable, is that um, there, this is perhaps a chance and opportunity for a reset button to be pressed, uh, that COVID has given us an unprecedented opportunity, uh, not only unprecedented problems, but unprecedented opportunity also to look at uh, what really makes our, our global community and our planet work, and where are we in all of this going forward? So uh, strangely enough, we never expected, I don't think Sarah expected when we uh, started this discussion that we would end up with love, 
uh, mindfulness, uh, sunlight and uh, uh, happiness as the outcomes uh, that would uh, really resonate with all of us. But there you are then. This is what happens when we put a diverse group of people together uh, to come up with ideas to solve uh, the problems that face us. So uh, thank you very much to all our distinguished panelists and especially to Dr. Kadira who couldn't be with us, but we valued his presentation very much. And we look forward to having you all with us at uh, another discussion uh, going forward. So thank you so much. And over to you, Sarah, to do the winding up. Right, indeed, Shyamali. I, uh, this is exactly what I was thinking. I wouldn't say it better. Um, humanity came through and I was, I was, you know, I was trying to think, what, what can I say? I'm going to talk about liberté, égalité, fraternité. And this is obviously my way of understanding it. And the fraternity has come through, not in your discourses, but in the sharing, in, in the process that you have, each one of you has adopted um, for, for tonight's event. And I am absolutely grateful for this. It was a, you know, such a diverse perspective, but then in the end, um, the fraternity brought you all together. I'm very impressed by it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiamali, for um, mediating this event so well. Um, thanks, thanks a lot. And, uh, I will not be too long. Um, I just want to wish you all a very good evening. Thanks again for joining us. And I think we can, we can leave it there, no? I think so indeed. And good evening uh, to everyone. Have a good, very good evening and stay safe uh, in these troubled times. Thank you once again. We are very privileged and honored to have had all of you with us, presenters and audience alike. And a wonderful job to Evangeline Evangeline for uh, her coordination and to Sarah for organizing. Thank you very much and good night. Mm -hmm.